I'm Connie Alexander. Miniature horses are living, neighing examples that good things really do come in small packages. Can you imagine the size of the horse, full-size horse, mind you, that will fit into this? Well, you don't have to imagine because we're going to show you some of those horses today. We're here today at the Calsonic Arena in Shelbyville, Tennessee at the Tennessee Miniature Horse Celebration. Humanity has depended on the power of horses for thousands of years. Breeds were developed and altered depending on the service they were expected to perform. The miniature horse is no exception. This size breed originated in Europe from several different sources. In the 1800s, draft-type miniatures were used in the coal mines to pull the ore carts in the shallow mines. Many of these horses lived their entire lives underground. These miniatures were stockier and less refined than the miniatures that were developed in the 1600s by European nobility. There are paintings from the mid-1700s portraying pampered miniatures with royal families. These equine ancestors of today's miniature horses lived in luxury. Lady Estella Hope and her sisters developed a breed line of miniatures in the mid-1900s in England. This breed line continues today. Many miniature horses in the United States can trace their lineage through the Hope line. The American Miniature is a height breed. The American Miniature Horse Association requires that a horse must measure no more than 34 inches in height at maturity. The measurement is taken from the last hairs at the base of the mane to the ground. This small, unique breed of horse has standards of perfection that are similar to the other larger breeds. They are expected to be sound, well-balanced, and symmetric. Mares are expected to exhibit refinement and stallions boldness. This small breed is known for its affectionate, gentle nature. They make wonderful companion animals for both adults and children. The foals of this breed are particularly adorable. They can range in size from 16 to 21 inches in height and could easily be held in your lap. These horses love attention and are both curious and intelligent. The popularity of the miniature horse has provided record growth for the breed. The miniature horse registry has seen a 400% increase in the past 10 years. Minis make wonderful pets for children. Their gentle nature and intelligence make them valuable members of therapeutic programs for both disabled children and adults. Miniatures are also being trained to perform as seeing eye horses for the blind. Because of their small size, only the smallest children can actually ride a miniature horse. So what can you do with these little horses? Many miniatures are owned and loved by people who find they no longer wish to handle a thousand pound horse, but don't want to give up the companion relationship they have with their horses. These horses make wonderful showmen and participate in more than 250 sanctioned horse shows all over the country. They show at halter and a variety of driving classes. They do not require the space or the amount of feed that larger horses require and can be maintained at about one-tenth the cost of a full-size horse. Miniature breeder Sandra Bradford of West Winds Farm in Pulaski, Tennessee talked with us about owning and enjoying one of these unique little horses. Sandra, who have you got here with you? This okay, morning? this is uh, West Winds Blue Velvet Dream. She's a, a three-year-old mare out of um, uh, Blue Boy background and Kamoko, and uh, she's, this will be her third year of being shown. Sandra, can you tell me how long you've been involved with horses in general? Well, I got my first one when I was 12 years old, and my mother always said that she hoped that was the one that would get me over the bug, but many times I got bucked off of it and everything I got right back on, and it just got worse as the years got, got longer, which I never did outgrow them. Uh, about seven years ago, I, I had uh, large horses all these years, and the last couple, like bucked me off and got me hurt a few times and I got hurt one too many times I decided to get out of them but I couldn't stay away from the horses so a friend of mine introduced me to my first mini and I discovered all the things you could do with them so that's where I went into them. Well the miniature is a very people oriented horse and uh, a lot of people think that because they're small they're like the ponies but they don't have the aggression that a pony can have with children so they're ideal for kids and uh, they seem to be even to me uh, more people are in it than even the large breeds of horses. Uh, I've had quarter horses in the past and you know the, the geldings are docile but the mares you know can be a little more finicky but as you can see with her being a mare you know she's just as sweet as she can be 
and uh, you know, I, I can really trust them around children and, and the handicapped. Do I understand it that, that some of the minis are at a size where even really, really, really small children ride them? Yes, I've got a gelding. He's 33 inches tall, and uh, he can handle a, a child maybe up to around 45 pounds. And they'll let you know when they get too heavy. They'll just kind of buck a little bit and drop the child off, which is not much of a drop. And, uh, but they can handle it pretty well. If they're stout or built, you don't want a real fine bone when you know, handling a child. Can you tell me, do, do the minis have more or different kind of health problems than some of the larger horses? Um, they have the same problems as the larger horses. The only thing that you might have a little more often with a mini is, is with their teeth because the, they do have large teeth for a small head and uh, a few people have had problems like having to have a wolf tooth pulled or uh, maybe misalignment or something like that. That's why the judges check their teeth when they uh, judge them to make sure that they're not like an overbite or an underbite on them. But other than that, they have the same problems and, and, uh, as the big horses do. How much area does a person need at their home in order to be able to have a mini? Well, there are a lot of places, if you can get uh, permission from your neighbors, that they have them in their backyards. Of course, you feed them hay then, but a, a miniature can uh, get by fine on a half an acre of pasture. Do they get along well with other animals? Uh, some people, they don't have one miniature. They'll have goats as companions or sheep or, or a dog. Uh, we don't recommend putting a miniature in with a large horse for the miniature's sake because even at play a large horse can really injure him with a kick. Uh, I've been breeding for about five years. I got my first mare then and uh, um, I've got about, uh, well I just have three mares. I try to keep it down small because I'm basically the only one handling them. Uh, breeding the miniature, the, the difference between them and the large horses is you're trying to breed your size down besides just the confirmation. They mostly like the Arab Arabian type and uh, so you try to breed for more refinement. But other than that, uh, uh, this year they started uh, allowing for cool semen, so like the big breeds of horses, they can ship it. But uh, uh, other than that, you try to find a, uh, a stud that's compatible in size-wise and, and uh, confirmation-wise that will really accentuate with the, the foal with a mare. And, uh, but it's uh, basically the same as the large horses as far as letting them do their thing. <laughs>
Let me ask you another question. What if, if a horse receives trauma to the eye, which could very well happen either in the trail or in the barn? They just have a severe trauma to the eye. Sure. What should a horse owner do? Okay, the first thing that you want to do is don't ride him because that would be very dangerous. He's likely to hurt himself or you. You want to guide him someplace dimly lit or dark right. until you can get a veterinarian to take a look at that eye. Okay. With traumas to the eye, you want to have your vet look at it as a number one rule because with the eye, we can't take any chances. We don't want to lose an eye. The and there are not that many home treatments that you can do. Right. So the best thing to do is to keep him relaxed. Don't let him be excited and agitated. Uh -huh. Keep him in a dimly lit area where there's not a lot of bright lights, intense lights right. on that because it will cause more pain. I see. And get your vet as soon as possible. As soon as possible. <laughs> okay. um, and another thing that, that, that happens frequently, our horse owners realize that their, their animal, their horse has picked up a nail in the foot. And here they have this protruding object. What should the horse owner do? The first instinct is to go and pull that nail out. But that's the worst thing that you can do. Yeah. You want to leave that nail in there until you get him to your veterinarian. If it's just a puncture hole and the nail has come out, mm -hmm. you can flush that area with peroxide or something like that or right. a betadine solution of some sort. Right. And then you can apply an antibiotic ointment in there okay. or Furox, which is a copper sulfate right. solution. Right. You can put that in there and that'll help to uh, close that wound up. But if the nail is still in there, uh -huh. do not pull it out. Okay. If it's only in there just a short way, then it's not really going to be that big a deal. Right. But you don't know. You right. don't know how far it is in there. Right. And if it's in there all the way up to that navicular bone, which is the first bone in the foot of a horse, exactly. that could be detrimental. Okay. And you don't want to pull that nail okay. out. So again, it's just keep him still and get the vet. Definitely. As quickly as possible. Yes. Another thing I wanted to know, some some people suggest um, that you keep a first aid kit in your barn the same way you do in your home. Do you think that's a good practice? I think it's a great practice. Okay. Uh, some of the horse magazines, horse companies, uh, equestrian companies, mm -hmm. they provide uh, makeshift first aid kits Excellent. that are specifically for your horse. Right. Or right. sometimes if you talk to your veterinarian, they might fix one up for you right. and provide you with some of the medications that you need. Okay. When I'm on the trail, I always, always carry a kit so that if not, if my horse doesn't need it, uh -huh. somebody's will. Exactly, exactly. Wonderful. So you think that, the, that most veterinarians would be able to, to give you a list of the kind of things that you need to keep there and how to use them? Most equine vets would be more than happy to help you avoid a worse situation than, than it originally was. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Cindy. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Did you know? King Henry VIII of England almost eliminated the Welsh pony breed when he ordered all ponies in England be killed. Natural disasters are a common reality and often leave destruction and even death in their wake. Our horses and other animals are more susceptible to this devastation than even we are. We talked with Mark McGuire of the Code 3 Disaster Response Team at Equitana USA. He discussed the vital service this response unit provides. Mr. McGuire, thank yes. you so much for being with us today. Uh, my, my pleasure. Um, tell me a little bit about your organization. I understand this is the Code 3 Associates Animal Rescue Project? That's correct. The Code 3 Associates uh, Animal Rescue Truck, actually, and what it does is it was designed to go to uh, a variety of different types of disasters, both natural and man-made, and provide uh, uh, a disaster rescue resource for animals uh, when people have been evacuated uh, or so that they will evacuate. Uh, we'll deal with both domestic pets but also deal with horses and other livestock uh, in situations where the animals are going to be in peril. Right, right. How long has it been in existence? The truck was originally uh, put together in early 1997. Uh, at that time, it debuted uh, with the American Humane Association. Uh, it sat idle for a while, and we subsequently put Code 3 Associates together during that time, and then incorporated as a nonprofit, began to run it then under that banner. What are some of the rescues that you've been involved in, some of the ones you've kind of described to you? Hurricane Floyd is probably one of the more, uh, well, the, one of the ones that are fresher in our minds. Yeah. So yeah. we did have about five different airlifts of horses out of Hurricane Floyd. Uh, we have some very good support people that came in from different locations. Dr. Madigan from University of California in Davis, who is responsible for the development, or partially responsible for the development of the Anderson Sling. 
Uh, one of the agencies that we partner with, International Fund for Animal Welfare, provided the helicopter. So we did do a number of horse lifts there. We also were involved in the removal of some of the livestock, primarily pigs and swine, hogs and swine in North Carolina with that situation. A lot of the others were dogs and cats, but um, uh, we do uh, we do provide for, we did actually work with some veterinarians in the Oklahoma tornadoes to provide some on-site surgery and care for animals oh, really? that have been that have been damaged uh, uh, from flying debris. Yeah. I, I know in a, in a disaster situation like a tornado and a hurricane, a lot of times people are fighting for their, you know, their, their concern is their own lives. But if, if people have any indication like, like um, a hurricane is approaching, what are some steps they can take to, to, to protect, to safeguard their animals? Are there things they should do? I think the first thing that I always recommend to people is if you have any inclination at all that you're going to have to evacuate, do it with your animals right away. Don't wait until the roads are clogged because a lot of times it's not going to happen and it's too late. Uh, in, the, in the case of, of horses, uh, if, you, if you have to evacuate, you should have your own trailer to be able to do that. Uh, if it's a matter of borrowing a friend's trailer, often they're using it for their own animals. You no longer have access to it. In the case of small animals, dogs and cats, you should have crates or carriers available to carry each individual animal in and be able to house them in for several days as necessary. Uh, veterinary records, vaccinations, uh, make sure the animals are properly identified, tags and microchips as, as necessary, uh, plenty of food, plenty of water, food bowls, all the necessary implements to be able to keep that animal contained and safe during right. the evacuation and after. Maybe Possibly after. a long period of time. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Thank you we very much. We appreciate you. My pleasure. <laughs> It is important to keep safety in mind at all times when dealing with horses. Kim Thompson points out some important safety issues you should be aware of while grooming your horse. These safety issues are as important for adults as they are for children. Okay, Emma, we're gonna go get our horse or get our okay. pony. We're gonna get a pony named Honey Bear. He's a Shetland Welsh okay. pony and he's over here scratching his back. So we're going to get him to turn around, and then we'll work on getting the uh, halter put on. And you can hold right there, and then I'll let you lead him out, and I'll be right behind you. Take him over to the washroom. There we go. Yeah. Okay, just walk him in, and then come toward me. We'll turn him around. Okay, now we're going to start brushing him a little bit. Okay? And we're going to start off... First thing, using a curry comb. And there's different types of curry brushes. It kind of tickles a little bit, but they seem to really like that. And that's going to help us loosen up all the dirt and get all the old hair out. Because if we look, he's still shedding. He'll be keep shedding for another couple of weeks before he finally gets his summer coat in. It takes him a long time for him to lose his. So you want to come over here? Okay, we're going to curry brush him. Now the main thing about currying just kind of go in circles. Just so you just don't want to be real hard on like their backbone or a bone, and you wouldn't use this on their legs. So you're just going to go in circles. And see all it's going to loosen up all that hair? So I'll let you do that. And we'll do it on the other side too. Yeah, see all that loose hair that's coming up that she's still trying to shed out? When he gets all shed out, he has cute little dapples. Can't see him now though. Okay, now let's be real careful and go under and go in front of him. Don't go right in front of him because if he moved, you're liable to be the one to get stepped on. So now just curry him on that side. It's nice and hard. You can do it pretty hard. That helps to loosen up, like I said, all the dirt and get all this loose hair off. So he'll be nice and cool as the weather gets hot. Okay, let's get back here on his rump. And be real careful about standing behind him. He's a good boy. And the fact you started up here and then worked your way down, he knows you're back there. That's good. But you always want to be careful, no matter how good the horse is. This feels better already. Yes, that's a good job. You're going with the way the hair grows with that. That's really good. Okay, there you go. Now, why don't we do the other side? Just be careful going underneath. Going with the hair growing. Look at all that hair coming off.
And he can also, with him shedding, use what they call a shedding blade to help get his loose hair off. But he's getting close to being shedded out. Now, we want to brush his tail a little bit. We're going to let him know we're back here. If we keep talking, he's used to people walking behind him. But we're not going to stand directly behind him, okay? So let's get to the side. Why don't you come over to this side? So that way, if he happened to kick out of a bug or a bee got on him, then uh, he wouldn't get us. You know, if it's very tangled, then you start at the bottom and work your way up, which this is pretty good. Got some little curls in there, it looks like, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. We also want to clean out his feet. We want to make sure, what are we going to do? Why are we going to clean out his feet, you think? Um, just so all of it won't build up. Say if a rock was in there, it wouldn't keep poking him. That's right. I'm going to do this foot, and then we'll, you do the next foot over there, okay? So I'm going to run my hand down him. He already knew what I wanted. And picked his foot up. And I'm going to start up here. And sometimes he's got a lot of stuff in there. Sometimes it doesn't. So some of you kind of get in the corner of the frog. You know that? It's called a frog. Doesn't look like one though, does it? Well, that's what it's called. You can get in the corner. And usually you can get them all off in one big thing. There we go. Okay, now he's nice and clean. We didn't find any rocks, so that's good. So let's go on the other side, and we'll let you do that foot. Okay, there you go. Okay, now just take your hand. Let's be real careful. No, let's be real careful. Take your hand. Just run it down. So he knows that's what he's supposed to do. Now, if you'll stand this way, like this, and you put your shoulder against him, that helps a little bit. And that keeps your feet out of the way. There you go. Sometimes it's packed in there pretty hard. Keep, this keeps you from being where you could get kicked or stepped on. And never, never put your fingers down there. Yeah, it's kind of heavy for a little girl like you to hold up his feet sometimes. Oops, this sounds like there might be a rock in there. There you go. Okay, thanks, got it. Good boy. And now while we're cleaning their feet, we can also check their legs, make sure we don't feel anything on their legs. I don't feel like they've gotten any bumps that have hurt their legs. We've already gotten their back feet cleaned out. And the other thing we always want to be sure is where the girth is going to go, that there's no um, little burrs or little places that might rub or might pinch when he would go to put the saddle on it. Okay, well, I think he's about ready to go. We'll have to go get our saddle and bridle to put on him. Good job. The 12th annual Tennessee Miniature Horse Celebration was held in Shelbyville, Tennessee at the Calsonic Arena. This annual event provides a showcase for miniature horses from all over the state. Representative of miniature shows across the country, this event allows participants to show off the months of work put into the grooming and training of one of these miniature equines. Minis are shown in a variety of classes. The halter classes are divided by age, sex, and height. Because the basis for the breed is height, special attention is given to the size of a horse when all other aspects are equal. The miniature horse can display any color or marking pattern. You will see miniature paints, palominos, and appaloosas. They can be dappled gray or silky roan. The objective of the breed is the smallest possible perfect horse. In addition to the halter classes, minis are shown in driving classes. These small equines are trained to pull a variety of carts and buggies. Youth classes also include both halter and driving. Showing miniature horses provides an excellent beginning place for children to enter the equine show world. These horses are less intimidating than larger horses 
and their size make them safer to handle for a small child. Lessons learned handling the minis can be instrumental in helping a young person advance to larger breeds. The Morning Sky Dancers perform several traditional Native American dances for the audience. The Buffalo Dance and the War Dance were performed in full Native attire to the sound of drums. One of the most exciting events of a miniature show is the Liberty Class. This exhibition allows the horse to run free in the arena for a specific amount of time. The owner must then stop the horse and bring them back under halter in a limited amount of time. The audience loves this class, and you can see why. These horses seem to know they are in charge and enjoy every minute of it. Watch them run. The Tennessee Miniature Horse Celebration is a must-see for anyone who enjoys horses. These small, gentle representatives of the equine world will steal your heart. From the largest draft horses to the smallest miniatures, all horses are a special creation. Those we take into our hearts and lives deserve the best possible care that we can give them. Unfortunately, there are horses who are neglected and physically abused every day. For all their size and strength, they are still subject to humanity. If you know of horses who are being abused or neglected, please get involved. Call your local authorities. Remember, the only voice they have is yours. As always, when you are horsing around, be safe 